for usual, I say, what's up, what's up, good morning, and praise the Lord, good people. How are we doing today? I don't know about you, but I mean, I had to contain myself after listening to Michaela, but I didn't want to be the only one in here going crazy, but I thank God for that ministry, that music ministry this morning. Uh, it is always a, a pleasure to be in the house of the Lord, and it's always an honor to be able to share this time and this space with you. We could all be somewhere else doing something else with someone else, and yet we are here together fellowshipping, worshiping the Lord, and for that I say amen. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, I am Brother Edward Walker, and I'm lucky to be a part of the teaching team here at Christ Church Charlestown. Um, if you are new here, welcome. For those of you who keep coming back, thank you. Uh, but if time permits, if, if I haven't met you before, I'd love to shake your hand before you leave today. Now, as most of you know, we have been working our way through the Old Testament this summer. We have been highlighting biblical stories and characters that in one way or another played an essential role in God's redemptive plan. And so today we will remain in the Old Testament and we will continue in the series, Lessons Learned from the Life of. Um, and today we're going to focus on Jephthah, the judge. And in this message, I will attempt to expound in three areas. First, we will talk about Jephthah, the fierce and faithful fighter which will show us what we can accomplish when we depend on God. And secondly, we will talk about Jephthah, the foolish father, which hopefully will remind us of how flawed and foolish and sometimes even fatal our decision-making can be when we don't know God. And third, we will make the connection between Jephthah and Jesus, at which point we will see some of the thematic and even the theological connections between the two, despite their historical and cultural differences. But the ultimate goal is always to connect the dots that leads towards the finished work of Jesus. But before we jump into the message, I just want to pray for us first. Heavenly Father, I just want to begin by saying thank you, Lord. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to walk your soul, you breathe your air. We are just grateful, Heavenly Father, to be able to rise from our beds this morning with strength in our limbs and the spirit in our hearts to make it into the sanctuary, to fellowship together and to praise you, Heavenly Father. And so we say thank you. Uh, many of our Christ Church family members are not here today for various reasons, Heavenly Father. And so we say that you, we pray that you bless them and stay with them, Heavenly Father. Put a hedge around them and protect them on the highways and the byways until they return to us safely, Heavenly Father. We also pray that your spirit is felt here today. Decrease me, increase you. Bless your messenger, for your word is already blessed, Heavenly Father. We love you, we honor you, and we magnify your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And so, uh, if you have your Bibles, join me in the book of Judges, chapter 11. If you are using one of the Bibles from the church, it's going to be on page 197. Again, that is the book of Judges, chapter 11. We'll touch on various different verses throughout this chapter, but I am going to be reading for your hearing verses 1 through 10. Again, book of Judges, chapter 11, verses 1 through 10. And the Bible said, now, Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty warrior, but he was the son of a prostitute. Gilead was the father of Jephthah, and Gilead's wife also bore him sons. And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah out and said to him, you shall not have an inheritance in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. And after a time, the Ammonites made war against Israel. And when the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, come and be our leader that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, this is why we have turned to you now, that you may go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. And so Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead and the people made him head and leader over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before the Lord at Mizpah. 
So before we jump into the story of Jephthah, it only makes sense for me to give a brief synopsis for the book of Judges, which offers a much needed context for us to understand the basis for Jephthah's story. So the first thing I want to tell you about the book of Judges is it is a troubling read, a very troubling read. It's filled with gruesome stories of war, detailed deaths, and it mentions unimaginable acts that most people just can't fathom, and yet it is the Word of God. And so when we read the stories told in the book of Judges, we have to interpret those stories within the context of the book of Judges, which historicizes the downward spiral of God's people as they become more and more like the Canaanites in the promised land that they are coming into, and less and less like the Israelites, which are the covenant people of God. One author called it the Canaanization of Israel. And so when we read the book of Judges, we must not be deterred by some of the rawness in the text. We can't be discouraged because some of what we, we read may not align with the theological images that we have created for God in our own minds. Instead, we must read it, we must sit with it, we must study it so that we might understand its relevance in our lives today. The second thing I'll tell you about the book of Judges is it begins with the death of Joshua. Now, as you might know, Joshua was the successor to Moses after the exodus from Egypt. And Joshua was the warrior that led Israel in the conquest of the promised land, Canaan. He conquered many of the Canaanites, and then he allocated land to the various tribes of Israel. But the problem is they didn't drive out all of the Canaanites from the lands. In fact, some of the tribes of Israel refused to drive them out, even though this is what the Lord commanded them to do. Instead, they became more like cordial neighbors and business partners, and they intermarried and the Israelites began to adopt the Canaanite ways of moral corruption and pagan religious practices, including idolatry and even sacrifice of children. Now, this all took place during a period of time when Israel's history was plagued with this chronic disobedience and this repeated departure from God. According to Judges 21-25, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So this repeated departure from God gave birth to this recurring cycle of spiritual rebellion and decline for the people of Israel. So in a nutshell, uh, the cycle in Judges looks something like this. In their efforts to be more like the Canaanites, the Israels would adopt all of their practices, and so they would fall into sin and idolatry, step one. Step two, God would get angry, and he would allow the Israelites to be conquered and then oppressed by the enemy. Step three, the Israelites would see the error in their ways, and so they would cry out for help, and they would repent, and they would pray to God to come and save them. And then step four, God would raise up a deliverer or a chosen judge, and he would allow that judge to defeat the enemy, and then that would bring on an era of peace. And then last, the judge will die, and so, of course, the Israelites would fall back into sin and idolatry. And as you know, God would get angry and allow them to be conquered and oppressed, and then they would see their ways, and they would repent and cry out for help, and then God would send another deliverer or judge to save them. Then that judge would die, and then they would go right back into sin. And this cycle would repeat itself over and over and over for hundreds of years. The third thing I will tell you is, as you may have known or guessed already, the book of Judges gets its name from the types of leaders that God appointed to Israel. And when I say judges, please don't think Judge Judy or Judge Mathis or Clarence Thomas, please. These judges were not legislative officials. They were national leaders, and they served as spiritual authorities, political mobilizers, and even military commanders. And ultimately, God appointed 12 different judges before the institution of monarchy. In other words, there wasn't a king overseeing all of Israel during this time span. And so the judges would exercise their authority over one tribe or a few tribes at a time, but never over Israel as one nation. And finally, 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 it's worth emphasizing the fact that each judge was appointed and anointed by God. Judges 2.18 says, whenever the Lord raised up judges for them, them being the people of Israel, the Lord was with the judge, and he saved them from the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. Now, just because God appointed and anointed the judges does not mean that he approved or sanctioned all of their decisions and all of their behaviors. In fact, I'm going to say plainly that he did not approve or sanction all of their decisions and all of their behaviors. Anointed and appointed, yes, but the judges were humans. And they were covered in flesh and therefore subject to evil, just like us, which points to the need for God's grace and the need for him to send a true judge, a true king, a Messiah that would rescue his chosen people, Israel. 
So after seven judges had come and delivered the Israelites and then died, there was an eighth judge, and his name was Jephthah. So let's talk a little bit about Jephthah, the fierce and faithful fighter. So Jephthah, which is a Hebrew name that means to open or he will open, was born in the city of Gilead to a man named Gilead and his unnamed mother. And sadly, we don't have much information about Jephthah's mother other than the fact that she was a prostitute. And it seemed, according to the story, that Jephthah was Gilead's firstborn child, which whom he had custody of. And the Bible tells us that Gilead had a wife, not Jephthah's mother, but another woman that bore him sons. And when those sons grew up, they made their half-brother Jephthah an outcast. They forced him out of the house, and they didn't want Jephthah around. And so they said, I don't want you having any part of my father's inheritance. But interestingly, back in Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verses 15 through 17, we learn that among God's people in the nation of Israel, a father was obliged to see his firstborn son as the principal heir. Not only that, they were obliged to give them a double portion of all that they had, but these so-called half-brothers were like, nah, you are an illegitimate child. We don't even know who your mama is. You have to get up out of here. And so they rejected him, and they ran Jephthah off. And just as a quick side note, there was another man that was rejected by his own. His brothers rejected him. His people rejected him. The world rejected him. All of us at one point rejected him, and his name is Jesus. As noted in John 1, chapter, um, chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, he was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. And so I imagine that some of us here today know what it's like, it like to feel alone or deserted or rejected, uh, misunderstood, forgotten, or abused. And so I just want you to be reminded today that you have a Savior who knows how badly it hurts to be rejected by those we love. And not because he read about your story in a book or he saw it in some documentary or he heard about it through the grapevine, but he experienced it for himself repeatedly by the ones that he loved the most. It was written in John 7, 5 that for not even his brothers believed him. And so I have to ask you, how many of you know that even in your rejection, you have been redeemed in Christ? Whether you've been rejected by your loved ones, your friends, strangers, or colleagues, when the world tries to convince you that you are worthless or useless, just like they did to Jephthah and then to Jesus, just know that God has placed value on your soul. So much so that he was all in on his investment and he sent his only begotten son who paid a ransom for our release from sin and all of his punishment, who made a way for us to be adopted into his family by grace through faith in him. If you believe that, I dare you to say amen. But Jephthah dealt with his rejection a little differently. He left Gilead and he moved to the land of Tob, where in uh, verse 3, the Bible tells us, worthless fellows collected around Jephthah and went out with him. Now, there's a lot of speculation about this verse here. Most people, including me, immediately jumped to the idea that Jephthah was angry, and so he moved to Tob and he started this gang of criminals, and he started hanging out in the pubs, getting drunk every day, and bullying people, and raiding homes throughout the town. And if we are honest, that is the more exciting, theatrical, Hollywood-influenced vision that many people will have. Why? Because society has trained us to think this way about the people that we have deemed to be worthless. But back then, to be considered worthless didn't necessarily mean you were a criminal. In fact, it often meant that you were either poor or without property or you didn't have employment, so you had to go out and get it however you could get it. But the other side of this perspective, the one that I am inclined to believe, is that Jephthah and his worthless fellows operated like uh, Robin Hood. They protected the citizens of Tob from people who traveled around plundering and pillaging. And in turn, they would receive food and drink and shelter and other forms of payment for their services. Yes, they likely plundered and pillaged as well, but some of us like to believe that it would only be against the enemy like the Ammonites. So no matter how we slice this pie, no one was looking for trouble with Jephthah and his crew. The Bible says Jephthah was a mighty warrior. Some biblical translations called him a man of valor. And this means that he had boldness and determination in facing great danger, especially in battle. He had heroic courage and bravery, and he wasn't some scary little thief in the night when he wanted something. He and his men went out and got it. They were unafraid of battle. They were prepared for battle. They even invited the battle. And this is why I wasn't surprised when the elders of Gilead went looking for Jephthah 
when war came up against them. Now, in full disclosure, brothers and sisters, I wasn't there at the time, uh, but this is how I envisioned it all went down. I can just see the elders of Gilead, including Gilead's sons, sitting in a circle, frantically trying to figure out who was going to lead them uh, in this battle against the Ammonites. The sons of Gilead were there, and they were refusing to step into a leadership position. In fact, they were arguing back and forth, saying, why me? Why can't it be you? And after days of deliberation, they pondered the question, well, if none of us are going to do it, then who can we call on? To which Gilead's sons responded, what about that no good half-brother of ours, Jephthah? And so the elders of Gilead went to Tob, and they found Jephthah. Verse 6 said, once they found him, come, be our leader, that we may fight against the Ammonites. But Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, did you not hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Did you not reject me and discredit me? Not even for anything that I've done, but simply because of who my mother is. Did you not consider me worthless and undeserving? Verse 7, he says, why then? Why have you come to me now in your distress? But brothers and sisters, is it not true that God can justly ask the same thing of us? I can tell you that far too often I used to be like the elders of Gilead, waiting until I was in distressed moments or in dire needs before calling on the Lord. And so I just want to encourage us today from time to time to just pause and say, thank you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I am grateful, Lord. I appreciate you, Lord. Psalms 104 says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise, Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Let's not always wait until we are in moments of distress. So Jephthah said, why have you come to me now when you are in distress? And the elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, this is why we have turned to you now. It's not to offer you an apology. We, we're not here to ask for your forgiveness, but we are here because we want you to go with us and fight against the Ammonites and be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. And I just love Jephthah's response. He said to the elders, if you bring me home again to fight against the Ammonites and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. You see, Jephthah was smart to bring God's will into the conversation. And I believe that this is indicative of his faithfulness. He knew that while he may have been the one going into battle physically, any chance of victory was going to come by the hands of the Lord. In fact, he implied, I will be your head if and only if the Lord gives the Ammonites over to me. You see, it is one thing to be big and bad and to rely on your sword, but it is another thing to be big and bad yet and rely on the Lord. And this is precisely why I call Jephthah a fierce and faithful fighter. You see, fierceness is good, brothers and sisters. It's favorable, and it might even increase your chances for victory, but faithful is required. It's better especially when you are in the army of the Lord, because faithfulness does not increase your chances for victory. It guarantees victory. Now, you may not win the battle according to the standards of the world, brothers and sisters, but our victory is in what will ultimately be. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulations. In other words, the Christian life is unavoidably one of toil, labor, and spiritual battles. But Jesus also said, take heart. I have overcome the world. Therefore, the victory belongs to those who believe in him. So clearly, Jephthah understood this. He wanted the elders of Gilead to know this as well. He said to them, although you may appoint me as your commander-in-chief, God is my commander-in-chief. But when people are desperate for your services, brothers and sisters, they will match your commitments, even if it is to the Lord. In verse 10, the elders said to Jephthah, the Lord will be witness between us if we do not do as you say. So what's happening here is the elders have placed themselves under the threat of the Lord's judgment if they did not follow through in making Jephthah the head over Gilead. You see, Jephthah was concerned that they were going to bring him back in, help them win this battle, and then deem him worthless and undesirable again. And so he needed them to make a commitment. And so the elders of Gilead swore before the Lord, the Lord will be a witness between us if we do not do what you say. And in that era... And in that culture, this was as strong of a contract as you can ask for. Nothing like these uh, attempts that we make to prove our commitments today. And I know some of you are thinking, what in the world is Brother Walker talking about? And so I am going to go out on a limb here and, say, and I'm going to say at some point, 
uh, in our lives in an effort to plead your case or to convince someone to believe in you, everyone in here has said, I swear to God. Yeah, I see your faces. Don't lie. I swear to God. And if you didn't say that, perhaps your preference was cross my heart and hope to die, stick a needle where? In my eye. Some of you have said, Lord, if I'm lying, strike me down right now. And every once in a while, you will see a real believer take a few steps away from that person. <laughs> but my favorite one was this one, brothers and sisters. This is my favorite one. I swear to God on the Bible, bro. Do you know that there are people that have never opened the Bible, yet they believe that it means something for them to swear on it? Now, this is a true story. I, I had a mentor. Um, she was my mentor for years, and one day we went to lunch, and I told her that I had given my life to Christ, and I had just begun my ministry. And she saw this as the perfect opportunity to tell me that she was a devout atheist. Now, it didn't change anything about our relationship. I still appreciated and loved her the same. But it did confuse me a little bit because I had seen behaviors and I had heard language from her that said otherwise. So one day after that conversation, we were talking per usual, and something came up in the conversation to which she responded, thank you, God. I looked at her with the side eye like, what God are you talking about? And she looked at me with these eyes that said, you better shut up, and so I left it alone. <laughs> but the elders of Gilead were swearing before God to honor their word to Jephthah. And so they agreed on the terms, and Jephthah went with the elders. And according to verse 11, the first thing Jephthah did as a judge was he spoke all of his words before the Lord at Mizpah. Now, this information is significant, brothers and sisters, because, again, it shows Jephthah's dependence on the Lord and not his own might, despite the fact that he was a mighty warrior. So he went to Mizpah. Mizpah is the name of a couple of cities, um, including a location in Gilead. And so it is a physical location, but it is also a term that means to watch or watch tower. So the idea of Mizpah is if a promise or an agreement is made at Mizpah, God is watching. And if that promise or that agreement is broken, God will see it, and he will punish the violator. And so Jephthah secured his agreement with the Gileadites before the Lord. And now, now that this is secure, he's ready to go to battle. But after leaving Mizpah, Jephthah started a campaign to avoid going to war with the Ammonites. I think this is a quality of character that needs to be celebrated, brothers and sisters, because a man of God should never want to immediately jump into war. So Jephthah and the king of the Ammonites sent messengers back and forth to each other. Jephthah asking, why do you have beef with me? And the king of the Ammonites said, I just want my land back. And Jephthah sent a messenger back trying to explain, but we didn't take your land. And in verse 23, he said, the Lord, the God of Israel, dispossessed the Amorites from before his people, Israel. In other words, God gave us this land. Why do you want to take it from us? You possess what your God gave you, we'll possess what our God gave us. Now, I think it's important for us to catch that, brothers and sisters, so let me repeat it. Jephthah said, you possess what your God gave you, and we'll possess what our God gave us. And this shows that Jephthah did not see this battle primarily between two armies. First, he saw it as a spiritual battle between the God of Israel and the false God of Ammon. In fact, halfway through verse 27, Jephthah says, the Lord, the judge, decide this day between the people of Israel and the people of Ammon. Again, showing his faithfulness and dependence on God. But of course, the king of the Ammonites wasn't trying to hear what Jephthah was talking about. He said, I want my land back, and so war ensued. And verse 29 tells us that the spirit of the Lord was upon Jephthah as he made his way to the Ammonites. You see, Jephthah was so bad. Jephthah was such a mighty warrior that he even took the battle to the Ammonites' backyard. So indeed, he was a fierce and faithful fighter, but he was also a foolish father. So let's talk about that. You see, before they went into battle with the Ammonites, verses 30 and 31 tells us that Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, if you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. This fool said, whatever comes out of my house. Now, I don't know what's in your house, but whatever comes out of my house to meet me first, I will give it to the Lord as a burnt offering. 
So Jephthah, in his hasty decision to make such a vow, could not have been more foolish and or unwise. The story tells us that God definitely delivers the Ammonites to, to Jephthah's hands. And when he returned, his only daughter came to meet him with tambourines and dances. And when he saw her, he ripped off his clothes as a sign of mourning and regret and sorrow. And then he had to explain to his daughter the vow that he made to God. Now, I don't know about your children, brothers and sisters, but if I told my kids about some vow, all of them, even the seven-year-old would have said, Daddy, we love you, but you're crazy. We are not going to go through this with you. But interestingly, Jephthah's daughter told him, do to her what you vowed to do. So this shows not only is Jephthah picking up paganistic ways from the Canaanites, he has actually led his daughter astray. So she thinks it's okay to just say, do with me whatever you vow to do. So first he granted her some time alone, around two months. And she went into the mountains with a couple of friends, and they just mourned the fact that she was a virgin child who would never get to experience life as a woman. Now there's a lot of discussion about whether or not Jephthah went through with the burnt offering or if he just offered his daughter as a, uh, a lifetime, I'm sorry, offered his daughter to a lifetime of service uh, to the tabernacle. And I'm not the authority that's going to close the loop on this debate today, but I believe in the word of God. And verse 39 says, and at the end of the two months, she returned to her father who did with her according to his vow that he had made. Now, I don't aim to minimize the daughter's story, but my goal is to draw our attention to the fact that Jephthah's story illustrates the foolishness of making vows without understanding the consequences of those vows. Jephthah sacrificed his daughter, an abominable, awful practice of pagan Canaanites. He lost a daughter, a child lost her life, and this was not how the Lord's people was supposed to live. You see, if he knew God better, Jephthah would have known that he didn't have to make any vows at all. And so we ought to know, brothers and sisters, that God will gladly and freely give us the help and the deliverance that we need out of the goodness and the love of his own heart. If only our course is rightly ordered before him, we don't have to make any foolish vows to our faithful father. But like Jephthah, we sometimes make these vows and say things like, God, if you do this, I'll do this. Or God, if you do this, I'll never do this again, just to put God under some obligation to us. It's like manipulation. When in fact, it is far more important to be on God's side than to try to persuade him to be on your side. And just so you catch that, I want to repeat it. It is far more important to be on God's side than to try and persuade him to be on your side. If you believe that, I dare you to say amen. So these vows, here's these vows. And Jesus taught us about vows. Jesus gave us some scripture about vows. In Matthew 5, verses 33 through 37, he said, Again, have you heard, it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is, his throne, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your own, by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. Simply put, brothers and sisters, your word is your bond. Jesus says, if you say it, then it better be true because a promise is a promise and there is no loophole in God's eyes to allow you to renege on that promise. Your word should be good. And just to be clear, Matthew 5 is not meant to discourage careful and well thought out promises such as wedding vows or legal agreements. I'm speaking specifically to these empty expressions that we use to boister our cases. Phrases like, I put that on my mama, or I swear on my kids, or I swear to God. And I know that I just challenged 99.9% .9 of the church, including me. But the principle here for Christians is clear. Be careful about making vows either to the Lord or to one another. The fact that we are prone to error in judgment means that we may make vows out of foolishness or immaturity. Jephthah and the Israelites were surrounded by these pagan nations for so long and undoubtedly influenced them into sin and idolatry, including foolish vows and including human sacrifices. And rather than dismiss this story that 
happened thousands of years ago, I encourage us to just see it as a warning, brothers and sisters, that if we allow ourselves to be canonized or influenced by the world, then we may find ourselves on this endless cycle of spiritual rebellion and decline. And so I ask you today, what or who are you holding on to that you should be removing from your life? What influences are you allowing to linger because it's fun or perhaps it keeps you popular or perhaps it generates money for you? Who or what are you allowing to keep you separated from God? This was the plight of the Israelites. They failed and sometimes refused to detach themselves from the Canaanites. But because of Jesus, isn't that a beautiful and powerful saying? Because of Jesus. It is probably the most important statement that any Christian is going to make, and it's the third and final thing I want you to see from this passage today. You see, Jephthah was rejected by his family and the city of Gilead. Many of us have felt the sting of rejection too, but because of Jesus, even in our rejection, we have been redeemed. A ransom has been paid. We have been delivered from sin and all of its consequences, and not because of anything you have done and will never be because of anything you will do, but only because of Jesus. You see, Jephthah knew that he had to depend on God going into the battle with the Ammonites. Yes, he was fierce. Yes, he was a faithful fighter. Yes, he was a mighty warrior, powerful with his sword, but he had faith in the Lord. And he knew that if any chance of victory was going to come, it would be by the hands of God and God alone. And because of Jesus, J.D. has said it a hundred times, Nick repeated it a dozen times, Stephen even put it in his sermon, and I'm going to repeat it today. Because of Jesus, we no longer fight for victory, we fight from victory. You see, the war over sin and the enemy has already been won. The victory is yours to claim and yours to receive simply because of Jesus. Now, the sad part of this story, brothers and sisters, is the fact that Jephthah didn't even have to make any vows or sacrifices at all. And because of Jesus, neither do we. You see, Jesus made the once and for all perfect sacrifice. He laid down his life and then he took it up again, providing uh, eternal life for all who believe in him and accept his sacrifice for their sins simply because of who he is, Jesus. And so with that said, brothers and sisters, I just want to leave you with some encouragement and ask you to think about these three takeaways. They won't be revolutionary. They won't be new for most of you, but the Spirit led me to tell this to you. And the first thing I want you to know is that God can and will use you for his purpose, even in your brokenness. You are not worthless. You are not useless. No matter where you came from, no matter what you did before, no matter who your mother or your father is, even if you feel broken in this moment, you are not defeated. So you have to believe what God said about you. You have to believe what Jesus has done for you. And out of that, brothers and sisters, you have to keep fighting faithfully. And please stop trying to devalue what God has already deemed invaluable. Number two, I want to encourage you to drive out your Canaanites. Put some distance between you and the things or the people that keep you separated from God. If there is anything or anyone trying to interrupt your relationship with Jesus, you might have to revoke their access to your life. If anything or anyone is influencing you to think or act in a way that might be displeasing to your God, you might have to withdraw. Now, I am not saying that you have to make them the enemy or defeat them or despise them even, but you must resist and reject their influences. You see, Israel refused to drive out all of the Canaanites And so it's no wonder why they were so easily Canaanized. I just challenge us today to Christianize our surroundings. I know that's not a word, but it is now. That's right. Number three, I'm going to encourage you to seek God's truth and guidance. You see, Jephthah's hasty vow highlights the importance of seeking God's truth through his word and seeking his guidance in all of our decisions. There will be times, brothers and sisters, when you have to make a hasty or a quick decision. And when that time comes, I just want you to seek God's truth and guidance because although it may have to be hasty, it can still be holy. So seek God's truth and guidance regularly. Spend some time in his word daily. Pray to him often. This is the spiritual discipline that prepares us for the extraordinary times. You see, we all have decisions to make, some small, some big, some of us Waste time thinking about what to wear, what to eat, 
We have to think about what to say, what to do, which TV shows to watch, which songs do I need to avoid, what time should I go to bed. We have business decisions to make, family decisions to make, relationship decisions to make, and so on. They all demand much thought and discernment. And so the question becomes, where does God fit in your decision-making processes? I'll end with this. Reverend Tim McConnell wrote in a devotional, those of us who call ourselves disciples, of Jesus have resources available through prayer, scripture, and the advice of more mature Christians who may have walked the same path. We want to make decisions that allow us to operate our lives within God's will and to be able to tell the difference between his will and our desires. Therefore, brothers and sisters, it is important for us to make wise decisions that reflect the heart of God. And like Jephthah, many of us are fierce and faithful fighters And like Jephthah, we all have had moments of foolish and flawed thinking and behavior. But fortunately for us, for all of us, because of Jesus, it has been made possible for all of humanity to have the privilege to repent, the opportunity to be born again, and the right to be redeemed. So I just encourage you to seek God's guidance in his truth. Let me pray for us.